This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On September 9th, the RCMI hosted our first Military History Night event of the Fall 2020 season with both a live and a virtual audience. Our speaker was RCMI member and past president Charles Scott Brown, airborne veteran of D-Day and Arnhem, who told us of his experiences as a Canadian officer on loan to the British Army. Code word, can loan. And all you have to remember to say is, Sergeant, you can't say that. <laughs> but I did. It's okay, I told him to get on the deck. You're looking great. You look very good, Charles. Yeah. You look really good. Well, for an old heart, you know. You look younger. 90, 97. You look younger all the time. Well, lots of blueberries. When you figure out what it does for the bears. I'm ready. Pat speaks. Not quite a couple of minutes, 705. Thank you, Pat. Welcome, and thank you for all the work you did, Pat, to make this happen tonight. Yeah, that was, that was really, really what a what, what a great thing that the first the first thing back in the RCMI's military history night. Mm. Thanks, Pat. Thank, thank you. you. That's right. Move your medals to the other side, then people can see. <laughs> Charles, your medals are showing. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Ready to go. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patricia Hind White, organizer of this event. Welcome to RCMI's Combination Live and Virtual Military History Night, September the 9th, 2020. This presentation will be videotaped for educational purposes. At this time, I would like to thank the RCMI behind the scenes team of President Mike Hall, General Manager Garrett Wright, Sylvia Lau, Event Sales Manager and in-house Zoom expert, Catherine Ely, Director Membership and Communications, Jim Lutz, Events Committee Chair, Eric Morse, editor, members news and director publications for their strong support and expertise. There will be a question and answer period following this presentation and as you mute your, mute your mics uh, with a camera off and hold your questions until that time. Uh, to um, mute the uh, screen, the um, the camera and the uh, mic, just click to mute and click again to unmute. Guest speaker Charles Scott Brown, a veteran of Normandy and Arnhem, is a long-term RCMI member and former RCMI president. His topic tonight, code words, can loan. At this point, I generally introduce our speaker. Tonight, however, it will be a little bit different and ask Honorary Colonel, the Reverend, Mark Sergeant, C.D., to make the formal introduction. That being said, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Pat. And thank you to everyone who's with us this evening, both here at the RCMI and anywhere literally around the world. It's um, no small feat, I think, that Pat Patricia has gone to great lengths with the staff here at the RCMI to make this happen. And I couldn't think of a better event to have than to have Charles with us to speak this evening, who in a magnificent way bridges not only great spans of history, but the old RCMI and the new RCMI and the period that we've all come through and then to be welcomed back into our home by your presentation this evening, Charles. Thank you very much, Father. When Patricia first asked me to come and introduce Charles, I just thought it was a really <coughs> odd request. Because anyone who'd spent more than 10 minutes here or had a casual interest in Canadian military history would know more about Charles than you really care to know. His footprint 
in this institution and his footprint in the Canadian Army is immense. And I'm so proud to be able to introduce Charles this evening. Because if you were to stand out on University Avenue and if you had stood there for the last oof, 70 plus years, you would have seen immeasurable changes on that street. The armory would have disappeared. Something else was built in its place. The road widened, the road changes, houses disappearing, other businesses appearing. Even our own RCMI changed and transformed into something completely different. But if you were really clever as you were standing there, out in the front doors of the RCMI, you would have noticed Charles and another, an immense group of men and women who had served and done incredible things during both World War I, World War II, and Korea. Names that are now pictures on our walls. And if you were lucky enough in that time to sit one afternoon quietly in the old long bar at a table and listen to Lancaster pilots and tank commanders, listen to infantry commanders, people who commanded great ships, who did immense things, sharing not just stories, but their love of not only this institution as a military institute, but their love of the men and women who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. Those people who continue to put themselves on the line for our safety and perfection. Charles, excuse me, <coughs> Charles would have been one of those faces, continues to be one of those faces, is that living link with our history. Recently, Charles agreed to speak to some of the sappers at 31 CER. <coughs> we had a professional development day, and because of my love of all things parachuting, we showed the movie A Bridge Too Far. And in the classroom we were using for the movie, we had uh, Brownings, we had Bren guns and Sten guns, we had Lee Enfields, and some of the troops could wear battle dress and webbing and the tin hat. And Charles was on the phone with the young sappers for an hour, talking about what, not just what warfare is like and his experience of it, but speaking clearly, inarticulately, and, and with great humor about being on that bridge in Arnhem. Being there, so that an hour later when they watch the movie, and they're trying to struggle with holding an Enfield, and they're trying to, like, battle dress is itchy and it's uncomfortable, he said, yeah, you just talked to a 90-plus-year-old man who was there. And see when he drags that major off the bridge with the umbrella? That's Charles. And that work with the bridges and the boats? That's Charles. So for Charles to have provided this visible and tangible and loving link between the history that's not just about great men and women in books, <coughs> but the everyday sense of how you work with NCOs, how you work with soldiers, how you work outside of your army in somebody else's army. How you come back and raise a family, live in a community, and be that constant for 70 years, standing out in front, welcoming people in. Lots of things have changed on the street, but thankfully, we have the gift of men like Charles, who have been consistent and caring and serving for us. And so without any further boring words, I would like to introduce Charles Scott Brown, CD, many, many gongs, members of, members of numerous regiments. And Charles, thank you, sir. Thank you, Father. Those words mean an awful lot to me because the man who gave them was probably one of the finest priests that the Patricias ever had. And not only that, he too paid a big price. He was in Africa, in Somalia, and he saved a black boy's life who was about almost killed. And Father Mark saved that young man's life. And then because of a series of bad events, 
the Canadian soldiers from the Airborne Regiment that were out in Somalia finished their tour, came home under a cloud and with political problems up to the ears, they didn't even give them a campaign medal for the work they did. And Father Mark should have been given a meritorious service medal for what he did to save that child's life. So it's very emotional. The infantry officers must prove to their men, and at 18, this book called Cold Word Can Loan started in 1943. England had been fighting a war for four years and she was desperately short of infantry officers. The Canadian Army found itself with a surplus of Canadian officers because the two, two of the home divisions, which were the only people that had conscripts in, the officers, warrant officers, and senior NCOs and NCOs, had volunteered to go overseas. The men were cons conscripts. And I talked to a lot of those guys because I trained them. Because I was getting ready to go to OTC Brockville. It was a very challenging time. But the biggest thing, and I think Mark will tell you, or and Craig from the Navy here, the hardest thing you have to do as a young man when you put your pips on is say, how can I look after these men? In 1943, when I was commissioned from OTC Brockville on the largest Congrat uh, presentation of commissions. There was over 580 of us on that parade square in Brockville. And I think we had all the padres saying a couple of words for us so it wouldn't rain because with that time and to walk through and get your sheepskin and walk off that parade square, with that number of candidates was amazing. I was 19. Fresh out of Jarvis Collegiate, worked to get my commission, passed the officer's selection and appraisal center, went down to Three Rivers and passed that and then was sent back because of my age. I was two months too young to go to Brockville. I went to A-10 Camp Borden as an officer candidate, and they wore gray patches on your shoulders and a gray patch behind your hat badge. And we ate and relaxed in the sergeant's mess because we were not officer cadets yet. When I was finally selected to go to Brockville, it was the largest class the Red Army had. And I was in B Company, and the company next to us was the French company called Charlie Company. And they had to give all their words of command in English. So we'd be standing on the parade square, and we'd just been called up to attention. And then all of a sudden you'd hear a French-Canadian accent say, Charlie Company, attention. Going no places, quick march. <coughs> that was Mark's time. 
<coughs> and <coughs> we used to tease them. I graduated from OTC Brockville, and I've never run and worked so hard in all my life in the three months that I did in Brockville. It was running battle drill anywhere from 8 to 12 miles most days. And because I was the baby of the platoon, I wound up with the boys' anti-tank gun. And that's the only weapon that was ever invented that did not have a central point of balance. No matter how you carried that sucker, it weighed 42 pounds. And you had a corporal standing right behind you. And on the second month, I finally looked at the corporal, and I was getting all set. The third month you spent in your special decor. This was all of us together. And I finally blew the first time in my life, and I looked at that corporal, I said, Corporal, if you don't get off my back, you're going to wear this boy's anti-tank gun as a bow tie. He got the message and got off me. And that was the first time that I'd gone back, because they were trying to see if they could break you. That was the type of training we had. We were highly trained, and we spent hours and hours and hours of running battle drill all across the Brockville area. Then we went to do our special decor, and that was back to A-10, Camp Borden, and I arrived there to become, I was a second lieutenant now, gazetted to the 48th Highlanders. And came down to Toronto, <coughs> saw the regimental Sergeant Taylor, and arranged for my kit and kilt and trues. wearing the 48th Davidson kilt. Then I went back to Camp Borden, A-10 again, and there was approximately 120 surplus reinforcement officers, whereas the British Army were very, very worried and panicking about how they could start a major operation assaulting Europe with the few officers, reinforcement officers they had in the stream. An infantry platoon officer has a life expectancy of approximately three weeks. If you break that three weeks, you're in. During the Quebec conference, Britain contacted and Churchill contacted the Canadian Prime Minister and said, I have been told by my people that you have a surplus of junior officers. We cannot meet our commitment for a potential attack on Europe unless we can find some infantry reinforcement officers. We desperately need them. Between the two and at that high area, they told them that Canada did have a surplus of officers. How many do you need? And they said, as many as you have. They said, give us a figure. They said, a thousand would be nice. They said, we haven't got that much. It's only two divisions that we turned off. So what they did was, 
they came upon a figure and they say, let's see what we can find as, re as volunteers for this. And what they did was they approached us and the messages went out to all the infantry advanced training centers and asking for reinforcement officers who would like to volunteer to get battle experience with the British Army. They'd be attached to the British Army for all purposes except pay. And court-martial disciplines. Sounds familiar that the South African movie actually had registered to some people. And Canada said, yes, we will see what we got. And they came up with roughly about 600 of us. 800 volunteered and approximately 600 were selected. That's right across Canada. That's an awful lot of trunks and an awful lot of kit to move. In Camp Borden, we had four sleeping cars from A-10 Camp Borden, and there was about 35 of us left from that camp right off the bat. And we went to A-34 Special Officer Training Center in Sussex, New Brunswick. It had been the holding camp for one of the divisions which had been stationed in the Maritimes. We lived in eight huts and we lived out of our steamer trunks. And steamer trunks stood up high. On one side of it was hangers that slid through and your uniforms were there and they hung. The other side had drawers and stuff, and that's where your socks, your gouchies, and all that kind of good stuff, and your shirts were put in there. And all the huts had double-deckers, beds. The top was your dresser. Your clothes went up there. The lower part you slept in. When we arrived down there, a very familiar face came forward, Brigadier Milton Gregg, a World War I infantry officer from the Royal Canadian Regiment. Standing in front of us with the VC MC and Bar from the First War. He said, gentlemen, what your country is asking you to do is very difficult. You are going to be leading soldiers who have been fighting for three years. Some of you, when they started the battles in the beginning of the war, were still in school. I was one of them. He said, the first and biggest challenge that you officers will have is to convince those British soldiers that you are capable of commanding them and bringing them through shot and shell. Very, very clear and concise. Milton Gregg was that kind of a man. He was the perfect leader for that group of infantry officers. And there were basically two groups. There was some group that were in their early 30s that were too old to go overseas as reinforcements and still very young and still in perfect physical condition. And then there was the youngsters like me and my group, our group, who were too young to go in because they wanted us to be in our early 20s, 
in the infantry, platoon commanders were anything from 20 to 25. Anything over 25 was ancient. Company commanders at 30 were tired old men. This gave them a shot at getting into action. And after the training we'd had and the three years that we'd been leading up to it, this was our chance. But then came the problem. How are we going to convince, how are we going to make sure that those British soldiers would follow us into action? Guys with a funny accent, different battle dress, different ways, different styles, different expressions. Petrol was called gas. And Milton Grade started to train us. A group of British officers came over, three of them, and they came to assist us and every morning there was usually a question period where you could answer, ask these people questions. And I remember some of those questions that were asked and four kitchens were turned into officers' messes. And each one of them had about a hundred officers in each 80-man kitchen. One side was where you ate, the other side of the kitchen was a lounge and a bar. The issue for beer was one case a month in New Brunswick. Sussex is in New Brunswick. Milton Gregg came from New Brunswick and he was considered the hero of New Brunswick from World War I. And fortunately, Moosehead became the beer of the mess. All of a sudden, the tooth fairy hit. We were not heavy drinkers, but we enjoyed our our party every once in a while and there would be a birthday and uh, there we didn't have to be practiced for mess dinners we'd already been through all that we were now learning to become efficient fighting officers then one day your voice would call out the numbers, you'd fall off the parade square into a separate group and you were formed into drafts and you were sent over. There was also four general hospitals in Sussex, New Brunswick at that time and they were waiting to go overseas and strangely enough there was a magical word they were nursing sisters with us. And they were the greatest gals you ever saw in your life. And we felt so embarrassed because if we were going out to a training area, because we were carrying weapons and in some cases loaded weapons, we would be out on and vehicles and taken out to a training area if we were doing live firing. And the nurses would be going out to their various areas where they were putting up tents and doing that work and getting ready for field general hospitals. A lot of the nurses were New Brunswickers, but they were old because even the young ones were 24 years old because they had three years of nursing training and then they had to have six a minimum of six months in a hospital 
before they could make an application to become a nursing sister in the Canadian Army. And when you're 19 years old, a 25-year-old nurse is old. But they were the greatest gals, and we made a lot of very great friends amongst them, and thoroughly enjoyed their company, and they would, we'd bring them in, to the, and they'd come in and visit our various messes, and we'd be talking as Canadians, and talking about getting overseas. Some of the lads who had been overseas would explain. The first thing we had to learn was money, and the hardest thing to learn in those days was the English money. It wasn't the decimal point. A pound had 20 shillings, and there was 12 pence to a shilling, and the whole thing was backwards. But before we actually did that, we had to pass swimming with our kit and physical conditions. At marksmanship was a must, and you went on the range and you stayed there until you became a marksman. Then finally your name would come up and you would be on a draft going. It was about, I guess, three hours, three and a half hours from Aldershot, where we were, into Halifax. And we boarded a ship called the Empress of Canada. And Mother and I had made a number of trips over to UK when I was young to visit my grandparents. And I was the Canadian grandchild. And my Scottish cousins were not the least bit happy that Granny took to the Canadian more than she did to the Scots. So I had had some training of how to get by and how to work with it. We got on the Empress of Japan, and the main lounge held a hundred people. On our draft, there were 300 officers can loan. And the hospitals got on with the nurses, the doctors, a high percentage of commissions for the number of people in the field general hospital are officers, with the result that that room was very, very busy. But you could book it. And as soon as that word came out, we had about 12 people in various areas trying to get that room, and we did. And once we'd get it, we'd say, okay, sisters, the bridge game starts at 1400, hope to see you down, we're looking for partners. And that was the big selling point on it. You could get a drink or two in the lounge, The male officers, Canlone, did duty officer in the ship. The ships in those days were blacked out. At night, they were completely black, and they zigzagged. So the submarines could not come up their rear and get a shot at where the fuel was stored in a lot of those large liners. Everybody was busy. We got to England. I landed in Liverpool. The hospitals were taken off first because they were going to designated areas. 
and then the Canlones were put on trains and taken to London to the London District Assembly Center. In the barracks which we were in were quite decent. It was a hotel that had been converted into temporary officers' quarters. The Brits were used to this because they were sending battalions in the peacetime and early war out to Africa and India and the Caribbean. So they were used to large numbers of drafts coming in and out. When we got there at the London District Assembly Center, we were brought into a large dining room and in most cases, they asked you what your choice of, of regiments, and they tried to send you, if you had been gazetted to a Canadian unit, they tried to send you to the British affiliated. But unbeknownst to them, one small problem loomed, and that is we had a good percentage but not a large percentage of French Canadian officers. And a lot of the French Canadian regiments, including the Van Dues, are affiliated to Welch regiments. Now the Welch people are not the easiest ones to understand because they mostly speak Gallic and it's Welch Gallic. And you get a Frenchman with broken English trying to explain something to a Welshman who doesn't understand good English, basic English, listening to Canadian slang, it was a problem. The few officers that we did have that did not make the cut in the London District Assembly Center was invariably because they British soldiers could not understand the Canadian officers on English. We lost about 12 officers at that stage. From there, the next morning, you were on a train and you were going to your affiliated unit, being 48 Highlanders. I went to a regiment called the Gay Gordons. And gay meant joie de vivre. The hot badge was there. And they were known as the gay, which meant jati, fun, fun loving. And these Highlanders, they could have a party organized in 20 minutes in the Sahara Desert and don't ask them where they found everybody, but those suckers could throw a party, as only the Scots can. When we arrived there, the officers were very open and very kind to us. They couldn't get over the beautiful kit we had. We had field fold-up beds. We even had a portable bath. Whoever put that sucker in there, I would have loved to have got my hands on his neck because the teasing we took for that was unreal. There was canvas bags for pails. But they had safari beds and bedrolls. And the bedrolls were sensible because your towels and everything like that made your pillows. And it rolled up and it was very sensible and very, very smart. Then we came to going out with the jocks. And I went to the second Gordons in 15th Scottish Division. And they were a thing called a fan out division. And they would be going in on about D plus five to D plus 10. 
and the original people that had landed in Normandy would try and punch holes in the German defense and then these divisions would come in, go through the hole that you had made for them and then they would fan out because we needed the real estate to get supplies off the ships as fast as possible because they were sitting ducks for the Luftwaffe. Our own Air Force did a good job at cleaning that, but they would still get in and they still created casualties. Fifteen Scottish Division had two Lowland Divisions and one mixed division. And the mixed division, at least uh, brigade, brigades. 154 Brigade consisted of the 2nd Gordons, the 7th Black Watch, and the 3rd Argyles. That's off the top of my head. I may be a figure out or two on the number of the battalion. 15 Scottish Division had not been blooded, but they had been used very heavily after El Alamein for 51st Highland Division. Because 51st Highland Division, the original regular 51st Highland Division, had been sacrificed in France with the old contemptibles to make the evacuation of the British forces out of Europe back to England and 51st Highland Division had to remain and hold the line so that Dunkirk was possible. And the joke became when I wound up with 1st Battalion, they had an officer casualty and they couldn't touch the first line reinforcements. They were 51st Highland Division. And it was one, five, two, three, and four brigades. And the center brigade was the ones that had the first Gordons, the fifth, seventh Gordons, which were half of each of them, were put together to make one. And the fifth Black Watch. Fifty first Highland Division was also. 153 Brigade of that division were going on sword, on sword Beach with the 3rd British Division. So you had 3rd British Division and you had 3rd Canadian Division and only the Brits could do it, God bless them. And those two threes, there was chaos in a lot of the work that was going on. But we had to find a way to get to these jocks. They looked at us, they respected us, they were nice to us, but they really weren't yours. And I usually tell two stories. The first one was when as soon as we got there, all the soldiers that were going to go in on D-Day took their worst battle dress, turned it into the quartermaster stores, their first complete set of kit, and turned it in, new boots, the whole bit, and get new kit, and your second best battle dress and boots and everything became your work ones. Because you don't want to all of a sudden have to provide a whole bunch of socks, shirts, and all that kind of stuff when you need ammunition and mines and reinforcements. When we got our kit, it was breakout break it in. And the first thing we got 
was one brand new pair of British Army boots. And they had a lovely hard toe cap on them, which with a toothbrush handle and some water and some uh, Vaseline if you could find it, and you work that in and you could get a beautiful shine on those toe caps. The Canadians loved them, we were used to them, we always tried to scrounge a pair, and here we are swimming in them. But they had to be broken in. I fortunately had grown up in a place called Temiskaming, Quebec. And Temiskaming, Quebec, all the pulp wood was formed there and it moved from Lake Temiskaming to the Ottawa River and it went right down the river to Ottawa and that's where the big match company was using a lot of this big and the place the shark boys made their money were lumber merchants. My uncle, my mother's oldest brother, was one of them. And he decided that he was going to go in the army, so he got out of his business, left it with his partner and two friends. Unfortunately, they had a good time while he was over, and he joined the PPCLI as reinfor a reinforcement officer and went over with the originals. Uncle Jack, or Uncle Ned, sorry, Uncle Ned survived World War I with a very fine record, and it helped me later on, no end. So I knew how to break in boots. And it's very simple. What you do is, you take two pairs of socks. The first pair of socks, you put them inside out. So the ridges are out. Then you put an ordinary pair of socks over them, so you've got two sets of ridges rubbing against each other. And two pairs of socks, which made your feet slightly larger. And what you do is you'd walk and find some water. You'd get that boot soaking wet to the point that you could feel the water inside your boot on your feet on your foot and then you go out for a walk and walk it dry. The leather would expand and then it would shrink when it started to dry out but with the two pairs of socks it gave you a slight bit of movement within the leather and you very seldom got blisters. So I went to my sergeant, who was Sergeant Hutchison, and I said, Sergeant Hutchison, we're going to break out the boots tomorrow morning. He said, yes, sir. I said, this is the way I want it. So I told him exactly what I told you. I want all the jocks with two pairs of socks on. And I said, we were in Slough, which was a suburb of London. That was like Ajax here. And in there were all the factories, in the factories in that area, were the chocolate bar factories. And who works in chocolate bar factories? Girls. So the Scotsmen back from North Africa, where they gave England their first big victory, and the Allies had a, finally had a victory they could stand up and brag about, in Africa, in North Africa, were in this area. And you'd go to the jocks and you'd say, what do you think of Slough Jock? And they'd say, oh, it's a great place, sir. It's sticking out, you kind of miss it, it's beautiful. They were having the time of their lives. And they deserved it, they worked for it. And then, I figured I got to put the candle under the donkey's nose to get it to move. So I took them out for a walk, and you always finish your route march, if you're smart, 
walking uphill. Somebody should tell the TTC sometime that it's easier to walk upstairs than it is downstairs. And if you ever notice, whenever there's a broken escalator, they always have the down one running, not the up one. The up one's easy because you lift your foot up and slide it in. When you're going down the steps, you're jarring your foot, your whole body, every time you step down one step. So I went to a pub and I said, I got a platoon and we're going to be doing a march to break in their boots. Oh, he said, that's awful. He said, you get blisters and all kinds of things. I said, no, you don't. I said, but don't worry about it. That's my problem, not yours. I want to get them a couple of beers at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, bring them around to the back yard. How many are there? And I said, 32 of them. He said, I'll look after them for you, sir. I said, good. I said, I'll give you a check for it. And uh, he said, that's fine. And I said, I'll pay for it all so it makes it easier for you. He said, no problem. I took them out for the march. And they were sort of looking at me, figuring, kind of just flipped his head. He's getting a wee bit daft. With all this crazy stuff of getting wet feet and two pairs of socks, whoever wore two pairs of socks? But they did as they were told, and the sergeants and their section corporals checked them. We did our route march in, sat them down the pub, they got three rounds rapid, and I ran them into the, into the barracks that were using the area which we were using, we were actually in billets. We were sharing houses. Billets in the army are when they come to the lady of the house and they say, how many bedrooms you got, madam? And they say, we've got three. How many people have you got in the house? We've got three. Ah, so you really only need one bedroom, don't you? <laughs> well, yes, okay will commandeer the other two. And they'll pay you for it, of course, but they commandeer the other two, and they'd put three soldiers in the two bedrooms. So that was billets. And uh, because when the British Army swells for a big war like World War II and World War I, you have to do that. In Canada, we usually use the football fields because there's always all kinds of room in the stadium underneath where all the benches are. So it's great. So what we did was they were marched in and I said, okay, lie down, take off your boots and socks, Lie down, put your feet up, and each section commander check. Not one flippin' blister in my platoon. So all of a sudden the jocks are looking and I says, maybe there's something right about this Canadian. He knows how to break in boots. Two days later we we're doing making men's. That's where you take your kit, and you call each section commander checks all the kits, and the ones, of course, they always check are the socks. And the corporals were doing their job, and they had it all going, and I was sort of walking around like a supervisor, making like I knew exactly what I was doing, and I was just hoping it was doing all right. And I was watching them, darn socks. And there's one jock sitting there, all by himself in the corner, and he's got his sock out, some wool and the needle, and he whips it around, pulls it, rolls it around twice, and ties it. And I saw him do this. And I said, jock, who taught you how to darn socks? 
He said, I got three sisters, sir. He said, I never darned a pair of socks in my life. I said, well, you better learn. So I reached down and took my fighting knife out, commando knife, and I cut the wool off and I said, come here, I'll show you how to do it. I said, you start with a fist, you put the sock over, you start it back and forth, looking over the edge so that it's just nice and easy, and you work it back and forth. Now when you get to the end here, you go up and down and do it. I learned it in scouts and cubs. And these guys, their eyeballs are flipping. And they looked over and they'd say, holy God, where did you learn that? And I looked at them and I said, where I learned it is not important. But I said, now you can wear those socks and with that darn, you'll never get a blister. And all of a sudden I heard the voice in the back saying, Canada's no bad, he knows how to darn socks. <laughs> they were my men. That remarked, they were my soldiers and they trusted me because what I taught them worked. Who was responsible for the training? The wolf cubs, the scouts, and Milton Gregg, because he said, just be yourself and treat them like any ordinary Canadian soldier and the Brits will love it. And they did love us and they trusted us. Oh, we got our apples. Sure, we had apples. About five or six out of 600 isn't bad. That was Can Law. And we were told when we went into Normandy, as infantry officers, our life expectancy was three to five weeks. You'll either be wounded or killed. They never lied to us. They told us the truth. And those two figures are correct. I was lucky. I lasted 21 days before I got wounded and stepped on a shrapnel mine on midnight 10th, 11th of July. Not June. And the soldiers trusted us and can loan as of then was successful. Code word can loan. What I've done, this belongs to the library. In this is a piece of paper which I have here. And this shows the can loan bottle dress. And if you wish to come up later, you can see our battle dress jackets. These are ones that were actually used in Europe with all the British divisional signs on them. We looked like a Christmas tree when we had all these things tacked onto us. And the can loan badge. And I'm wearing that badge on my can loan tie. And it tells its date. Look how narrow it is. Would you believe the 60s? And it's still on active service. But let's see what this costs. And this is a bit interesting. If I can find my glasses, here we are. There's nothing wrong with my eyes, really. It's just my arms are shrunk. And here is what can loan cost, it, cost us as Canadians. Killed in action, 128. This is out of 680 men. That happens to be 29%. Wounded, 
310. That happens to be 50%. Prisoner of war. These were basically the ones that did the Arnhem battle, and they were in the glider brigades, and they came to 46, and that was 25%. The total figures was 30, 78% casualties. Operation Can Low. I'd be only too glad to answer any of your questions if you'd like to ask me. Yes, sir? Charles, thank you for the, uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, when Canlone officers met up with Canadian officers in Normandy, what were the relationships like? Uh, we were, were Canadians. We were Canadians. We were buddies. They'd say, how, how are you doing with the Brits? We'd say, great, these are nice guys. Because they were. Good. And they were good to us. And they treated us fairly. And if anybody did more patrols, it's because they asked for it. We did a lot of patrolling. Because we were good at it. We would played cowboys and Indians as kids. And some of you guys are almost old enough. Not quite yet. I'm 97 now. And I was one of the babies. Yes again, sir. Supplemental. When Say again? When these came in, um, did the Canadians try and pull Canlone officers back from the Brits? The, ori the original re uh, agreement was six to eight months. And when the Brits got us, they liked us, and they asked if we could stay with them and the Canadian military headquarters. We had an office with the Canadians, we had an office with the Brits. And the first thing they had to do with us is the Canadian officers in World War I and World War II did not have regimental numbers. They went by their surname. So the first thing my father told me was, Charles, drop your hyphenated name. Because every time you look, it'll be, you won't be able to find your, your file. It's, some will have it under the S's, some will have it under the B's. So he said, for goodness sake, don't use your hyphenated name. So I was Charles Louis Scott, hy no hyphen, Brown. So I went by the surname of Brown. And all of us did, who had hyphenated names. But we used Canadian leave hotels in uh, Brussels and Paris. We had our own 51st Highland Division uh, leave centers. We could go there, we could go to either one. It was up to us. Sometimes if we wanted to be quiet, we'd go to the Canadians and uh, we'd bring a couple of our brother officers from a Scottish regiment. They loved to see the hotels and they liked the Canadian food. They loved hamburgers. They loved coffee because they got nothing but tea. And that's another story. As a matter of fact, I'll take two minutes and tell you. In early Normandy, my jocks had this biscuit can with two holes punched on the side and a piece of a coat hanger, metal coat hanger, and that was the, the section tea mug. And it was black, filthy, and dirty. So we had a quiet couple of days, so I snapped the sucker went around, got some soap and water, and cleaned it. And all of a sudden, I could hear, what in the hell's happened to the tea mug? 
Somebody's cleaned it. And I said, yeah, I did. Why? Holy God, sir. We've had that one since El Alamein. It just had a nice flavor and a good talk to it. And you've taken all the good stuff away from it and you left the dirty, filthy inside stuff. From there on in, I said, okay, guys, I won't touch anything tea, but I'll make the coffee. They said, you're on. And that was it. And that's how we worked. The worst job we had was writing letters to the next kid. I hated that with a passion. Trying to tell a mother and father, an aunt or an uncle, or grandparents, how you killed their son. And then I came up with the deal that I try and tell a story of exactly what he did and how it happened. And I told him the truth. And the next thing I knew, and Father Mark is here somewhere, the Padre came up to me and we had the RC Padre in the first Gordons. And he came up to me and he said, Carly, he spoke the tongue. That's Gallic for Charles, Charlie. He said, Carly, I've had some nice letters come back from the next of kin saying that the Canadian officer that wrote the letter that, about their son getting, getting killed, that they appreciated it no end, that you told them the truth and exactly what happened. So Farley Mowat wasn't correct when he said, any story that you uh, wish to add a 10% flavor to it is worthwhile. It's not. Tell the truth. I think Father Mark will agree with me on that. Because he unfortunately had the same problem of writing letters to the next of kin. The Padres always wrote to ones, especially the officers and the non-commissioned officers and the warrant officers. The men they knew a lot of them, and if they did, they would write also. But that's the biggest thing you can do, and that's the biggest thing. And you always told them that if he did do something a bit risky and a bit dangerous, pushing his luck, you never told them that. You just said that he was doing his job, and he was doing it efficiently well, and unfortunately, a German got him. Any other questions? Yes? So Charles, you talked about uh, all of you meeting all the nurses who were much older women. Do you have any idea how many of the, the Japs actually end up marrying the nurse from that? My dad was 20 when he married my mother, who was 24. Yeah, and my mother and, was uh, a sister. <laughs> so I, I, it's, it's, I, I found it very touching, uh, and it's amazing how people end up reconnecting or connecting. <coughs> and a lot of war brides, you know, came here. Yes, uh, we normally. The can loans, we were normally sent to uh, the closest field general hospital that was in that area and being used. So, in some cases, the British units used Canadian hospitals, and the Canadians went to British hospitals, and then by the time they got back to the zone base hospitals, then they were put into their slots of being Canadian or British, or when they went, got a blighty and went back to England. If you got back to England, we would always be sent to a Canadian hospital. I wound up at uh, 18 Canadian General and 19 Canadian General in Colchester. And uh, the first of its kind 
uh, was Roman Way Convalescent Depot, and that was the first convalescent depot used and invented in World War II. And the amazing thing is the amount of good that has come out of the wars as far as the medical corps. So with the result, when we just got this big slap in the face six months ago, and the Canadian Armed Forces went out to help, they did the right thing. And they went out and they called a spade a spade. Any more questions at all? No? I guess not. No. Well, there you have it. Well, that was an absolutely spectacular presentation, Charles. Thank you very much for sharing well, both enlightening and humorous uh, account of your experience as a, as a very young soldier uh, during one of the darkest periods of the 20th century, the Second World War. And at the risk of repeating myself, first-hand account has no rival and sub or substitute, as we all witnessed this evening. Thank you very, very much, Charles. It's so much appreciated to have a first-hand account. Now, at this time, I usually present a thank you gift from our CMI to our speaker. And once again, a departure from the usual and call upon Susan Cook, our CMI Executive Assistant, to do the honors. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Charles, uh, on behalf of the RCMI, Thank you so much. It's our first event we've had since all this crazy COVID started, and it's a pleasure to see you here and give you this token. Thank you very much. We've known each other a long time, so. We have. Thank and, you. And uh, if anyone deserves a clap, it's this young lady. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.